Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome for another episode, uh, The Doc is In. Uh, my name is Dr. Uh, Mahdish Kukani. I am the Department Chair for Laryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. And today we have Dr. Uh, Mario Carubino. He's a, a consultant in the uh, Department of Plastics uh, at Cleveland Clinic uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, the topic today is on microvascular reconstruction in head and neck cancer. Head and neck cancer accounts for about 4% of all kinds of cancer. Uh, there are more than half a million people newly diagnosed yearly in the world uh, with head and neck cancer. The most common is squamous cell carcinoma, but there are other, many other causes or many other types of uh, um, uh, head and neck cancer. And the, uh, usually the management uh, can be a surgical uh, radiation, management or with chemotherapy or a combination of these. Uh, when it comes down to surgical management, we are talking about ablative surgery. Uh, ablative surgery means uh, removing the uh, cancer where it is located in the head and neck. We're talking about mouth, throat, neck, sinuses, nose, and um, that would leave a defect and that defect need to be reconstructed. In the older days, they used to use what we call local flaps or regional flaps, uh, but really the microvascular surgery uh, had revolutionized uh, the management of the reconstruction in the head and neck. So today we have Dr. Mario uh, kindly will tell us and explain first, Dr. Mario, what is microvascular reconstruction in head and neck or overall, what is microvascular reconstruction? Mighty, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for your question. And it's funny to be uh, again with you, like in the <laughs> operating room, that uh, I am the one that is yeah. coming after your surgery to, to, to continue the second part exactly. And this is how does it work, microvascular surgery. So um, these surgeries are the one where the, are the one that are taking care to transfer tissue from one part of the body to another one. Um, creating the, the, the component of the organs that have been removed by you in our cases uh, or by the demolition part. So microvascular means that we have to follow the artery and the vein who are keeping this tissue alive in the donor site, take it off cut the artery and the vein together with the tissue that we want to transfer to do the reconstruction of the other tissue that is lacking. If it's a tongue, we are talking about something that will be uh, similar to the mucosa, so the skin and the soft cutaneous tissue. And um, if it's a, a mandible, of course, we are harvesting some other bone, like could be the fibula, and to do the reconstruction of the missing part that has been removed by our ENT or our ablative surgeons. Okay, so uh, we'll come back maybe in more like having more examples and how, how the function works, but how do you see like the microvascular uh, surgery compared to the older kind of, we still we use it obviously yeah. when we talk about regional, it's not older, no, but, but it's not usually now the first uh, line of uh, reconstructing. You know, so why do you think that's the case? So the case is um, back in the days when you have the demolition of a partial of the tissue, because unfortunately we have to remove the cancer, and uh, you have the option to let heal by secondary intention. So basically doing nothing and let the wound close. But these are the situation where the tongue, the remaining part of the tongue or the remaining part of the um, oral cavity will be stuck by the scar tissue. And so these patients will never be able to speak again, to drink or to eat again by the oral cavity because everything will be glue inside of the mouth. So the standard local flaps are just to harvesting something closer to the mouth to bring and to cover the defect. With the microvascular, we have been um, developed a different situation. Exactly what does it mean? That we are able to fill the defect with the tissue that is more similar 
to the one that has been removed, with the same pliability to reducing the scar inside of the mouth, to reducing all the possible complications like the fistula formation and every other problems, and give a tissue that it looks like the one that was missing. And this is exactly the same way how the reconstructive surgery works. Replacing the like with like tissue. So if it's the mucosa is missing, we put the skin that it's really similar to the mucosa. If it's a bone missing, we put the bone. And we harvest from other parts of the body, even far away, uh, but they, they have the same characteristic and the same um, uh, quality of the tissue that is missing. Uh, can you give the audience like what examples of, uh, you know, I know you can use the medical term for what you use, but, mm -hmm. uh, so, but it's good just to give them idea. Like you mentioned the tongue, where, where would you get it? Like an ELT or yeah. would you do like a, a so, forearm? Uh, if we are talking about a glossectomy, so it means that removing of the entire tongue, we can harvest the anterolateral part of the thigh that is uh, uh, the quality of the skin and the quality of the soft tissue. Because I'm talking about the skin, but in reality we are harvesting several different tissue to do the reconstruction of the tongue. Because we are talking about the epidermis, the dermis, the subcutaneous fat, the Even fascia, the muscle, muscle, and yeah. sometimes if we need, we always uh, harvest a portion of the muscle, that in this case it's the vasto lateralis. And all of these tissue are staying alive because there is one vessel that is keeping them um, with the blood flow. And these vessels, it's the descending branch of the circumflex lateral of the femoral artery. And once that we reach this artery and the vein were together, we cut them, we transfer them in the neck together with the tissue that we want to transfer, and we recreate a three-dimensional reconstruction of the tongue, of the missing part of the tongue. In this way, the portion that has been removed will be completely reconstructed, and we do the microanastomosis on the microscope. So this small artery and this small vein are being reattached and keep them alive. It works exactly like a transplant of an organ. It's a real transplant. What about if you have a smaller uh, portion of the tongue being resected? What would be your choice of lab in that case? If we are talking about a smaller portion, the old forearm flap is still viable. Uh, however, we do in a perforator way, so it means that we spur the artery and we harvest all these small, small vessels that can be transplanted instead of sacrifice one important artery, like the arterial artery for the hand. So these are the evolution of the last decades. Mm. So we are transferring small part of the tissue when there is no problem in the donor side, and because it's very important to not stolen from one side to repair the inside of the mouth. So we're trying to have less invasive in the donor side, but have the same high quality results inside of the hand. And if we have like a composite resection where we take the bone, as you mentioned, the sometimes floor yeah. of mouth and the tongue. Yeah. So now we have all kinds of tissue that's missing. Um, but, uh, what would you, uh, what would be your choice of lab in so these cases? A, as we always do yeah. in these cases, yeah. our first choice will be the fibula flap that is um, one of the two bones that God give to us in the leg, but it's not a bone that is important for any reason. So you, everybody can live without, uh, without the fibula in the leg. And we use that for do the reconstruction of the portion of the bone that is missing. Together with this, we harvesting also a portion of the skin and the fascia to do and restore the missing part of the mucosa and all the different complex is there any other bony flap that uh, can be used? Depends on the quality and the amount of the bone that has been uh, removed. Sometimes we use the obviously the uh, uh, iliac. iliac crest bone flap that it's quite bulky, very good quality. Um, in particular, if we are planning for a young patient to restore the dental implants, we use the iliac crest bone flap. It's important to call them flap because it, it means transplant, because this is the big difference between the graft. 
when it's a graft, is without the blood vessels. You are taking a small portion of the tissue to restore the small defect. But if it's a, most of our cases are three-dimensional, mm -hmm. complex defect that you do, and in our reconstructing surgery, we have to fill with this different and complex defect with something that is viable, something that has blood supply, and the blood supply needs microvascular reconstruction. So now we talked about resections and we talked about reconstructions, but I think the most important at the end of the day is functionality. Hmm. You know, yes, you replace a tissue with tissue, is there a way now to measure the quality of life or the function? You know, you mentioned the tongue, you know, the speech, the swallowing. Uh, what are we doing with that? Like in the, in the medical field, uh, in the literature now, what, what are people doing? With that? That's a good question because as Lord Kelvin say in 700, if you don't measure it, you don't know if it works. And uh, yeah, so the speech therapist and our system here in Cleveland Clinic, all the teams, because this complex situation, a very complex humor, is never, is never one man show, but it's a team dedicated that is giving you the best results. So it's important to, for the speech therapist to do um, an approaching to see how will be the final results and the function, it will be how you, a patient with this complex surgery will be able to swallow again and to drink again and if, it heal and in, in a sufficient way to go back to have dental implants, rehabilitation of the complete restoring smile and appearance. So. Yeah. And I think just to add to that, I think right now um, in the otolaryngology um, literature and actually we are here at Cleveland Clinic in our department, we're starting as uh, patient reportable outcomes. So of it's course, really of important. Course. To, to see you know, these patients uh, uh, pre-op and post-op, and I think that would potentially um, make us gauge you know, the, the, the success of the surgery, not just the survivability of the flap, uh, but the, the functionality success as well. But that leads me to the next question is, you know, how do you consider a flab is successful? Like from a survivability standpoint, when would you say, hey, you can sleep the night <laughs> and that this flab is good, you don't have to be doing. And what are the, in the same, you can use the same uh, discussion on the post-operative care. You know, what, what do you do to make sure that this flab is, is functioning properly? So the, these flaps, these transplants, are based on very microscopical artery and vein, who are called perforators. And they are very delicate because using the perforator, we reduce the morbidity of the donor site. So it means that we harvest a very small artery, very small portion. However, they make it quite um, delicate in the receiving site. So in our experience, we have a very high number of success in terms of surviving of the flap and um, almost 100% of them are surviving. However, to have a surviving flap doesn't mean that it's, we reach our final goal, that as you mentioned, it, it's based on only when the patient restores a good quality of function, it will going to be a successful rate. Um, the first days are the ones who are very delicate for this transplant, so the immediate post-operative care, it's very important to keep an eye on that. And that's why we are used to send them to the ICU unit, very high qualified nurses staff are taking care, we're checking every hour that this transplant doesn't have any issue with the vascularity. If they survive the first 24 up to 72 hours, we finally start to think, okay, the transplant is working, nothing of complication, it's happening in the immediate post-operative situation, so we finally can breathe and sleep a little bit more during the night. <laughs> Uh, that's good. And I uh, maybe didn't ask uh, this question earlier, which is about actually preoperatively. Uh, are all flaps, do you need to do a lot of, what is there certain tests that you have to do? Are there patients not qualified mm. to have this? Because it's important for our audience to know, are there patients all of it can qualify or there are people you will say, hey, you're, 
you're not really going to qualify and you will not have a successful club. So in our personal experience, I will say that uh, no, all of them are qualifying to do uh, microsurgical reconstruction. In the moment that they can do um, demolition surgery, there is an indication to, to try to do um, a reconstruction. Uh, Preoperative test, of course, it's important because we have to see the vascularity of these flaps. So an NGOTC scan, it's most, basically it's the, our main, um, main exams to see how is the vascularity of the bone in case of the fibula or the tissue and everything, how the vessels are distributed because these are helping us to do the planning of the surgery and to know exactly based on which vessels we are going to do the reconstruction. So if there is an indication to do a demolition, we think we can do the reconstruction as well. Okay, so my, my question to you back is, well, there is a lot of patients come to you, hey doc, I am diabetic, I have peripheral artery disease, uh, I have high cholesterol, I mean, are these patients are still can undergo this uh, reconstruction? No problem. No problem. Of course, they have problems <laughs> because diabetes, muscular smoke, it's mm -hmm. definitely something that increases the the um, the risk of these uh, different uh, situations. So these are patients who have higher complication rate, and the complication rate can go from losing of the transplant, losing of the flap, down to delay of healing, a lot of things can happen because as you know, it's really complex surgeries. However, there are not total contraindication to do the microsurgical reconstruction. Maybe we are not going to choose a very thin, um, delicate flap. Maybe we are not doing a perforated flap. Maybe we go for a more traditional mm -hmm. radial forearm flap where the blood vessels are bigger and safer. But still, there is an indication to do. Further, yeah. um, well, let me ask you the last question. Where do you see, is there any innovation coming up in the field of microvascular reconstruction that I think will make the surgery more successful, uh, potentially, um, uh, even the success rate will be better, better quality mm. of, of patients post-operatively? So, uh, yes, I, I mean, it's a field with an incredible innovation in the last 10, 15 years. Um, first of all, the better quality of the imaging, as we mentioned in the CT scan, nowadays we are 3D planning the resection with the osteo guided that again, giving us the idea how much of the bone will be removed and the planning in the, um, with the computer before it's going to let us know that we are doing something inside of the operating room that was already planned. And this is an incredible innovation of the last period. And with the better imaging, it will be even see easier and easier to do this kind of surgery. Moreover, there is a new aspect of the robotic surgery that is developing in these cases. So trying to do a minimal invasive harvesting of this flap, but even the new robotic of the microsurgical anastomosis to make it this easier and easier to do. Um, when I started, it was necessary doing a quite long training before that you can manage the microsurgery. Nowadays, the new generation with the new training system will learn easier and faster than me uh, with, because all of these new innovation and the robotics assisted microsurgery. So oh, well. I think it will be better for the patients comparing to 30 years ago, the flaps that we are doing are less morbidity, less invasive, and it will be easier also for the doctors in the future to use these devices and this opportunity. Well, that's really great. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Mario. I think uh, you did a great job explaining uh, in a layman, terminology, you know, what we do here um, uh, at Cleveland Clinic. And I would like just to summarize that we do have here at Cleveland Clinic a comprehensive uh, head and neck uh, uh, program that can manage uh, all kinds of uh, pathology. And we have uh, uh, all type of doctors that can address this from ablative surgeons, reconstructive surgeons, radiation oncology and medical oncology. 
And uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you on another episode.